your face I cry out because you're holy.
Abundant 
Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to morning devotion number 499. Tomorrow will be our 500, so uh, it's going to be a significant one tomorrow. So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for giving us the gift of your words, that we can know you personally through your words, and our lives can be transformed through the power of your words. So even this morning, we ask for your clarity, even as we study your words this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. Uh, so yesterday, uh, Pastor Malcolm brought us through Exodus chapter 36. And today, we are looking at chapter 37. And uh, chapter 37 is almost like a repeat of chapter 25 and chapter 30. Whereby in chapters 25 and 30, God tells Moses how to construct the items within the holy place and the holy of holies inside the temple of the tabernacle. And then now in chapter 37, we see all this work being done by a man named Bezalel from the tribe of Judah, uh, if you refer to Exodus chapter 31 verse 2. <clears throat> so, just for a clear picture of the measurements of the tabernacle, one cubit equals to 45.6 cm. Therefore, 100 cubits equals to 45.6 meters or 4,560 centimeters. So the outer enclosure or the courtyard of the tabernacle has a size of 100 cubits by 50 cubits. And the temple itself is measured at 30 cubits by 10 cubits, whereby the Holy of Holies is measured at 10 cubits on all sides. And the holy place is 20 cubits long and 10 cubits wide. <clears throat> so, when a priest enters into the temple of the tabernacle, he will find three things. Number one, the golden lampstand on his left, and then the table of the bread of the presence on his right, and then the altar of incense in front of him. And as he goes deeper past the altar of incense, past the veil separating the Holy of Holies, he will find the ark and the mercy seat. So this morning, we'll be looking at four specific items being constructed. Uh, number one, the Ark and the Mercy Seat. Number two, the Table of the Bread of the Presence. Yes, that's the name. Uh, number three, the Golden Lamb Stand. And number four, the Altar of Incense. So we've already studied these objects over the past few weeks, but we will continue to dig deeper uh, just to see the spiritual significance of these items. And let's begin with the first item the ark and the mercy seat. So Exodus chapter 37, verses 1 to 29, but we'll start with verse 1 to 9. Bezalel made the ark of acacia wood, two and a half cubits long, a cubit and a half wide, and a cubit and a half high. He overlaid it with pure gold, both inside and out. He made a gold molding around it. He cast four gold rings for it and fastened them to its four feet, with two rings on one side and two rings on the other. Then he made poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold, and he inserted the poles into the rings on the sides of the ark to carry it. He made the atonement cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and a cubit and a half wide. Then he made two cherubim out of hammered gold at the ends of the cover. He made one cherub on one end and the second cherub on the other. At the two ends, he made them of one piece with the cover. The cherubim had their wings spread upward, overshadowing the cover with them. The cherubim faced each other, looking toward the cover. So, in verses 1 to 9, we see Bezalel constructing the ark and the covering of the ark called the mercy seat. And uh, all these were according to the measurements provided uh, and given by God. So, the entire ark and its poles was made with acacia wood and it was covered with gold. And it has four feet and four gold rings attached to the ark. And then on the other hand, the mercy seat have two cherubims on top and it was made purely from gold itself facing inward. So this was the first item. And now to the second item where Bezalel constructs the table of the bread of the presence. Verse 10. They made a table of acacia wood two cubits long, a cubit wide and a cubit and a half high. Then they overlaid it with pure gold and made a gold molding around it. They also made around it a rim a hand breadth wide and put a gold molding on the rim. They cast four gold rings for the table and fastened them to the four corners where the four legs were. The rings were put close to the rim to hold the poles around in used in carrying the table. The poles for carrying the table were made of acacia wood and overlaid with gold. And they made from pure gold the articles for the table, its plates and dishes and bowls and its pitchers for the pouring out of drink offerings. So, 
this table was constructed to actually hold uh, the sacred bread uh, that will be eaten by the priests uh, that we will see later on. And in verse 10, even though the word used was day, but it's actually referring to Bezalel himself. So the table was also made with acacia wood and covered with gold, and it has four rings attached to the table. So, and, and on the other hand, the other items that is on the table were made purely from gold, like plates, dishes, bowls, and pitchers. Then we arrive at the third item, where Bezalel, Bezalel builds the golden lampstand or the menorah. <clears throat> so verse 17, They made the lampstand of pure gold, they hammered out its base and shaft, and made its flower-like cups, buds, and blossoms of one piece with them. Six branches extended from the sides of the lamb, three on one side and three on the other. Three cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms were on one branch, three on the next branch, and the same for all six branches extending from the lampstand. And on the lampstand were four cups shaped like almond flowers with buds and blossoms. One bud was under the first pair of branches extending from the lampstand, a second bud under the second pair, and a third bud under the third pair, six branches in all. The buds and the branches were all of one piece with the lampstand, hammered out of pure gold. They made its seven lamps as well as its wick trimmers and trays of pure gold. They made the lampstand and all its accessories from one talent of pure gold. So, the lampstand or the menorah is made of one shaft in the middle, followed by six branches springing out from the middle shaft, and on top of each branch and the shaft was a cup where they lit the fire. Uh, sorry, this is a modern way of litting the fire, where they lit the fire. So the Bible does not record its specific measurement, so we can't say for certain how small or large it is. Uh, but when you look at verse 24, uh, Bezalel bids the entire golden lampstand and accessories from one talent of pure gold. Today, one talent of pure gold equals to 8.3 million ringgit or around 1.87 million US dollars. So it's a very, very expensive menorah and the whole tabernacle is fitted with pure gold. Expensive, right? And last but not least, we see Bezalel constructing the altar of incense. Verse 25, they made the altar of incense out of acacia wood. It was square, a cubit long and a cubit wide and two cubits high its horns of one piece with it. They overlaid the top and all the sides and the horns with pure gold and made a gold molding around it. They made two gold rings below the molding, two on each side, two on each of the opposite sides to hold the poles used to carry it. They made the poles of acacia wood and overlaid them with gold. They also made the sacred anointing oil, oil and the pure fragrant incense, the work of a perfumer. So the altar of incense was made with Again, acacia wood and it was covered with gold and it stood right in front of the veil that separated the Holy of Holies from the holy place uh, within the temple. And the priest would burn the incense on the altar every morning and evening when he attends to the lamps. And of course, a sacred anointing oil will be used to keep the lamps burning while a perfumer would regularly prepare a special fragrance for the incense. So, <clears throat> the Ark and the Mercy Seat the table of the bread of the presence, the golden lampstand, and the altar of incense. So just before we move on to the devotional thought, let me just uh, sip a sip of water. <clears throat> okay, so just morning, this morning, I just want to share with us a devotional thought on dwelling in God's presence. That as we look at the four specific items in the holy place and the holy of holies in chapter 37 we are reminded that when we dwell in god's presence he will forgive our sin he will sustain our life he will convict our hearts and he will hear our prayers so let's begin with our first point god forgives our sin so both the ark and the mercy seat actually have a very significant meaning the ark represents power and authority of god and the covering of the ark, also known as the mercy seat, represents the throne and grace of God. So once a year, on the day of atonement, uh, the high priest would enter into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God resides. And he would sprinkle the blood of the animal sacrifice onto the mercy seat. And the whole of Israel would find mercy and grace from God for their sins through that act, right? As God forgives through the throne. And thousands of years later, this significant act was fulfilled when Jesus Christ died once and for all for the sins of the world and took away sin uh, by the sacrifice of himself. You know, and, and so even when we come before God's presence today, we are reminded that not only of 
God's power and authority and righteousness and holiness, but we are also reminded of God's grace and mercy for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. And Romans chapter 3, verse 25 tells us that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate His righteousness because in His forbearance, He had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. So here, the word sacrifice of atonement comes from the Greek word hilasterion, uh, and it refers to the mercy seat. All right, hilasterion, mercy seat. And so the mercy seat represents the spiritual cross of Jesus Christ where our sins are forgiven. So when we dwell in his presence, we are reminded that God forgives our sin through the cross of Christ. You know, If you're listening to the devotion this morning and, and you are struggling with a certain sin or you're struggling with a certain addiction, I want you to know that God wants to forgive you and he wants to enable you to walk in his freedom. But it requires you to first say, yes, I want to change and I don't want to live in sin anymore. And for you to come before his presence and let God administer his grace and healing into your life so that you can turn away from sin. We cannot do it on our own strength. On our own strength, we're just going to keep struggling, going back into the cycle of uh, falling and again and, and again and again. We can only overcome sin through the power of the cross. We need God. We can't do it on our own. So no matter how terrible or messed up uh, whatever things you've done in the past, I just want you to know that nothing is too difficult for God to forgive. And all of us here this morning who believe in Jesus have access to God's presence through the blood of Jesus Christ today. Why? Because He is our mercy seat. Because of His blood shed for us, God can now forgive our sins. Alright, so number one, God forgives our sins. And as we dwell in His presence, we are also reminded that God sustains our life. So the table of the bread of the presence, uh, as I mentioned earlier, holds the sacred bread, right? And what the priest needs to do is he needs to place 12 loaves of bread on the table in two stacks, six loaves per stack. And the 12 loaves of bread actually represent the 12 tribes of Israel that time. And on Sabbath day, right, on the final day, the old loaves of bread were removed and eaten by the priest in the holy place. And then the priest would replenish the table with new loaves of bread. So when the priest uh, places the 12 loaves of bread on the table, he would also burn the incense as a meal offering to God in thanksgiving to him for daily bread. And even for us today, our daily bread does not refer to physical food or perishable things that are here today, but gone tomorrow. In fact, our daily bread refers to the word of God that we need to feed on every day. You know, Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 4, verse 4, that, that it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. And he also tells us in John chapter 6, verses 48 to 51, I am the bread of life. Your ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which anyone may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. Whoever eats this bread will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which, which I will give for the life of the world. So the bread isn't just a physical piece of item, right? It is the word of God. And when we eat this spiritual bread or when we eat the word of God daily, we will live and we will not die. And Jesus himself, he declares that he is the living bread. He is the living word, in fact, you know. And when we fill ourselves with his words daily, we are actually drawing sustenance and life and strength from him spiritually. So as we dwell in God's presence, we are actually reminded of the need to eat the word of God daily, for it is God himself who sustains our life. So if you're here today, and you know, you're watching all these morning devotions as well, I just want to encourage you to also spend time uh, alone, read His Word daily, even if it's just a few verses, going through the Bible or having another uh, daily devotion with you, all right? Um, spend time with His Word because we are able to find our strength, our source of life from His Word. And as we dwell in God's presence, we are also reminded that God lights up our worship or God convicts our hearts, all right? So, since there weren't any windows to let in natural light from the outside, the golden lampstand was the only source of light available in the holy place. Uh, without it, the priests or the high priest would not be able to carry out their uh, work in a temple. So the question is this, what does light do? Number one, light reveals things and makes them clear and noticeable. 
So Jesus tells us in chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In fact, Matthew chapter 11, verse 27 says, No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. So Jesus Himself makes it clear to us who God the Father is, right? That's what light does. It reveals and makes things clear and noticeable. So Jesus makes clear who God the Father is to us. What else does light, what else does light do? Number two, Light also illuminates places of darkness and brings to light what is hidden. The thing is this, our evil hearts are in constant rebellion against God and against His uh, sovereign rule over our lives because of sin. And we can only be saved and redeemed from this sinful nature through the sacrificial death of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. But the thing is, we actually don't know this we wouldn't know this and we need the light of Jesus to reveal to us the condition of our hearts so that we can choose to respond to Him, right? It, uh, if you don't think you're sick, you won't go to the doctor. If you think you're healthy all the time, why do I need a doctor, right? So Jesus Himself re reveals to us the darkness of our hearts and exposes the evil and the wickedness within it to us. And without the light, we would never know that we have a heart problem. So, as we dwell in God's presence, uh, God convicts our heart to not only know Him personally, but to also show us areas that we need to turn away from. We have a heart problem and only Jesus can cure us of this problem. And God doesn't just want us to keep this cure to ourselves, um, but ultimately to tell others about the love of Jesus Christ. So, when we dwell in God's presence, God will convict our hearts, right? He will convict our hearts uh, not only to come to Him personally, close to Him, but to also turn away from things that are breaking His heart and to realize that we need Him more than ever so that we can tell others about Him as well. And last but not least, we are also reminded that God hears our prayers. <clears throat> so, the priest would burn incense on the altar every morning and evening when he attends to the lamps, right? So there's this smoke coming up from on top of the altar of incense when he's burning the incense. And in the Bible, uh, burning incense is often a picture of prayer. We can see that even from King David when he prayed in Psalm chapter 141, verse 2. He says, May my prayer be set before you like incense. May the lifting up of my hands be like the evening sacrifice. So incense... Uh, speaks of prayer and the altar of incense is reminding us that we need to always pray before God if we want to live, right? Those who don't pray will die. Why? Because prayer is actually the breath of the soul, you know? If we don't pray, we will die spiritually, all right? Uh, if we don't spend time in prayer, we will slowly, slowly drift away and eventually we will become numb to prayerlessness. We don't even see the need and the importance for prayer anymore. And the thing is, when we pray in faith to God, we need to remember that it doesn't just fall on deaf ears just because we are praying and we can't see God doesn't mean He's not listening, you know. The thing is, no prayers that we offer to Him will ever be lost, but instead it will be answered in God's way and in God's time. Revelation chapter 5 verse 8 tells us, And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the Lamb. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And Revelation chapter 8 verses 3 to 5 tells us that another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense, together with, together with the praise of God's people, went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and hurled it on the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. So this is, if you look at this two passage in Revelation, it shows us how valuable our prayers are. You know, that the angel even brings them up in a golden bowl before God. And even when we look at the Lord's Prayer, uh, I think some of us even memorize this. We don't even need to refer to this, right? In Matthew chapter 6, verse 9 to 13, we are actually given a prayer pattern to follow. Matthew 6, verse 9 to 13. This, then, is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. <clears throat> so when we pray, we must remember that God's concerns comes first before we bring our own requests. Right? Our own personal requests must be tested by whether or not we are sincerely concerned about honoring God's name, about advancing God's kingdom, about doing God's will. All right? Prayer isn't getting our, our will done in heaven. It's getting God's will done on earth. And even back in those days when the high priest was uh, going to the tabernacle, I'm sure he didn't just rush into the tabernacle, quickly burn the incense and then rush up by God. Pew, you know, he didn't, it was a rush hour for him, you know. Instead, he prepared himself and respectfully and reverently approached the altar of God, right? Why? Because he knows that he was in the presence of the Holy God. So as we dwell in God's presence, we are reminded that God not only hears our prayers, but we are reminded that our prayers must seek the will of God. And we can know God's will by praying. You want to know God's will for your life? Pray, okay? So to conclude our devotion this morning, as we look at the four specific items in the tabernacle in Exodus chapter 37, we are reminded of what happens, sorry, we are reminded of what happens when we dwell in God's presence. Number one, God forgives our sin. Number two, God sustains our life. Number three, God convicts our heart. And number four, God hears our prayers. And this wraps up our devotion uh, this morning on Exodus chapter 37, dwelling in God's presence. So just one question for all of us to reflect on this morning. What is one thing that God has spoken to you or me, uh, even through the message today uh, from our text today? All right, so let's just take about a minute uh, to uh, reflect and before I close with a word of prayer. Okay, come, let's pray. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you for reminding us this morning that we have full access to your presence even through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And this morning, you are reminding us that when we dwell in your presence, Lord, we can find forgiveness for our sins. We can find sustenance for our lives. We can uh, find convictions in our hearts for things that matters to you and that you hear our prayers and you will answer them in your ways and in your timing. So we pray that you will help us to place our faith and trust in you and to know that you will work all things out in our lives as we continue to walk closely to you and serve you faithfully. So we give you the highest praise this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Next, uh, we want to pray for our happiness group. So over the past two Sundays, we were very blessed to have both Brother John come and Pastor Andrew Ng to share their stories with us over the past two weeks. And we are now entering into the next phase of our happiness group where we'll be conducting a water baptism session for uh, all the new believers or even uh, Christians who may not have been baptized yet and followed by our renewal camp and discipleship school level 1, level 2 and level 3. So let's pray together for this next phase of our happiness group, round three. We're going to pray this uh, in one voice, uh, verbally, out loud. So let's pray together on the count of three, two, one. Lord Jesus Christ, you have commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. So we ask for a stirring in our hearts to go into all the world and preach the good news of Jesus Christ to everyone you lead us to. 
we declare that CBC will be known as a church who loves people and a church who actively, intentionally and regularly tells others about the gospel. We declare that many will come to the saving knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ as we continue to sow into the hearts of our friends, families, colleagues and neighbours. May our church be a lighthouse that reflects the life and love of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, next, we want to pray for our CBC uh, and associate churches. Uh, we want to pray that we as a church will live with a strong sense of identity and purpose to remember why God has places in the, placed us in these respective communities all across Malaysia, that the Lord will complete what He started here in CBC. His will be done in CBC as in heaven. Amen. And number two, pray that we as a church will continue to go deeper in our walk with God through the reading of His Word, through prayer, and through serving one another and serving the world, that the love of Christ will be so evident among us. So once again, we're going to pray this together on the count of three, two, one. Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for your faithfulness toward our church and for your vision in all these wonderful communities all these years. We pray that our church will continue to be a lighthouse to reflect your life and your love to the communities you have placed us in. Help us to live purposefully and to glorify and honour you in everything we do. We pray for a strong conviction in our hearts to cultivate our walk with you daily, that we will prioritise the reading of your word, prayer and serving one another as our main goal. And we pray that at the end of our lives, we will be known as people who love God and loves people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Amen. Last but not least, we want to pray for our country, Malaysia. Uh, as uh, Pastor Gordon mentioned last Friday as well, we want to pray for the victims uh, that were affected by the flood in Baling, uh, that they will be able to find aid and resources to rebuild their life and families. I think more than 1,000 families or 1,000 people were displaced by it. Number two, we want to pray uh, even on the matter of logging, de deforestation and mining. Pray that our government will implement proper measures to prevent over-logging, deforestation and mining in our land as that seems to be contributing to the, to the displacement of many Orang Asli communities as well as envi environmental effects um, and even the wildlife, you know. So pray that those in power will not give in to greed but instead protect the forest and the wildlife from disappearing. So come, let's pray this together on a count of three, two, one. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, we call upon your grace and mercy upon the families affected by the Baling flood recently. Send them aid and resources and comfort them during this difficult time as they try to rebuild their lives from the flood. Thousands of them have been displaced, so we ask that you will provide for them in due time, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We also pray that our government will continue to exercise wisdom and discernment in handling the matters of logging, deforestation, and mining in our land. We pray that those in power will see the importance of protecting forests and the wildlife and also empathize with the Orang Asli communities who have been displaced because of all these things. We pray that you will renew and revive Malaysia from sin, from corruption and from injustice, that the right men and women will be appointed to power to rule this nation righteously. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all for praying together with me. Uh, and as one church, as one family. And thank you for being a part of Morning Devotion today. We will see you tomorrow morning, even as Dr. Elder Ong Silian uh, facilitates our next devotion once again. So have a wonderful day at work or even at school. And we will see you tomorrow morning.